Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for part two of the September technically Q&A series. Uh, this part probably is in October, but for us it's still September. Um, lots of great questions in part one, so check out that video if you haven't already, but we've got plenty more questions to get through in part two, so we'll get to that in just a moment, but before we do. Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their new 12th gen CPU contact frame by DeBauer. It's well known that the integrated loading mechanism or ILM of the LJ1700 sockets bends 12th gen CPUs, leading to an uneven contact surface that reduces cooling performance. Solving this issue, the contact frame replaces the ILM, allowing for a much more even contact with the CPU's IHS and the base of your cooler, which in turn reduces operating temperatures. Installation's quick and easy, and thanks to the use of anodized aluminium, the contact frame is non-conductive. And then, for those of you who wish to further maximize contact, Thermal Grizzly now offers an optional lapping tool, so for more information, please check the link in the video description. All right, Steve, big question that we're probably gonna be diving into a fair bit here. What is your opinion on EVGA quitting their relationship with NVIDIA? So obviously this is a few weeks ago now, by mm. the time this Q&A has come out, but we did get a few questions around yeah, well, I'll just say, time. you know, a lot of you, a lot of you on our other videos were like, when's our video coming out covering this? When are we giving our opinions, our thoughts on it? And I replied to uh, uh, as many of you as I could and basically said, well, I don't really have anything of value to add to this. We never really worked closely with EVJ. We're Australians. EVJ is not that big in Australia. Yeah, the, that's right. So... Um, obviously we know who EVGA are and we know how big they are in North America and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, obviously Steve from Gamers Nexus did a much better job of covering it than we could have because he was invited to an exclusive meeting with the CEO and got all access there. And they did a great, a fantastic job um, covering that. So you may as well just watch their video. You might as well just watch their video. Um, but as for like, what are our thoughts on it? Do, do I have, do we have any thoughts that sort of haven't been discussed by those who are much closer to the story? I mean, not really. I mean, I think <laughs> I, the, my initial reaction, I guess, when r seeing this news was that I found it interesting that there was evidence now in the public sphere of NVIDIA treating their board partners in a less than favorable way, let's say, because Which, there's always been rumors and there was the GPP several years ago now, there has been many stories of NVIDIA using unsavory tactics, let's say, uh -huh. towards their AIB, AIBs and other partners and all sorts of different companies. And it's very interesting that EVGA mentioned some aspects of that on the record. Mm -hmm. That surprised me because previously with a lot of those issues, it was more rumor sphere type stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good that there's it's good that there's now more of a public discussion around that aspect of things. Because certainly when we speak privately to AIBs, there has been frustration over the years about how NVIDIA has treated AIBs um, for various different yeah, very different things. I like guess it's good. It changes absolutely nothing, though. It changes how, nothing, yeah. but I think it's it's good that it's no longer like a conspiracy theory because mm -hmm. when things are rumors, there is a tendency for you know it's it's unclear where those rumors are coming from, whether they're valid or not. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously, usually when there's smoke, there's fire, as people like to say. But I think with this EVJ situation, it's now sort of confirmed to mm -hmm. some degree confirmed beyond what people were willing to say previously. And I, th I found that interesting, which I guess is just, that was my initial takeaway. I wasn't surprised or anything that no. this was what was happening. No. I was just surprised that a company was like, we're quitting GPU making and it's NVIDIA's fault, um, at least. Yeah, it was definitely shocking. Yeah, um, definitely interesting revelations in that sense. Yep. As uh, for adding anything of worth to the conversation, which again was why I told people that we weren't going to do a video. Um, it was nice that a lot of you wanted our thoughts and stuff on it, but um, yeah, um, I'm, we don't just do videos for views. <laughs> if we don't have anything to add to the topic, we don't jump on the bandwagon. And We could have done a video and got plenty of views on that, but yeah, um, unless I've got something of interest to add, I don't get too excited to make the video, so we didn't. But yep, we've, we've much. talked about it now and... Um, <laughs> And probably pretty I, uninteresting. I think, well, there's another question about EVGA as well, <clears throat> which you may as well just roll into this one sure. because it's very similar. Sure. Uh, what kind of ripple effects do you see happening following EVGA divorcing itself from NVIDIA? Are there other AIBs that might follow suit 
or will another brand see the opportunity to swoop in and become a more preferred partner? Um, well, it's, yeah, I mean, it seems like EVGA made the decision for a multitude of reasons. Some of it was respect um, and, you know, they, they, they wanted to be able to provide their customers, their loyal fan base with a certain quality of product, which they felt they couldn't do going forward with the margins that were given to them. Um, and they didn't have creative freedom to do some of the things they wanted. So they were sort of like, well, we can't meet the objectives we want to. Uh, so what's the point? It's kind of like what I was yeah. saying. Like, if, if, we, if we can't make a video where we feel like we're adding some sort of worth, then we're not just doing it for money and views, then we won't do it. And EVJ situation is <laughs> much more extreme, but I think it's a similar sentiment. There's like, you know, they, they, they can't achieve what they want to achieve. So they're like, well... You know, not only can we not achieve what we want to, but we're being very disrespected, a partner of, what is it, 20 years or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I don't expect any <laughs> other AIBs to follow suit necessarily. Certainly the ma major manufacturers have a very diverse product portfolio. So, you know, when, we, when we're talking about those three big companies, they've got so many products that if they're making not great margins on GPUs, then... Well, they make motherboards, they make monitors, they make power supplies. Well, these days they're making like memory storage, all sorts of different mm -hmm. product categories. It's kind of like they're so diversified that, you know, they can take the hit to some degree from from NVIDIA mistreating them or whatever may mm -hmm. be happening. I'm not saying that's happening with those board partners necessarily, but, you know, that's that's the way things are. And I think EVGA had less of that. They had some other product categories, but wasn't it like they were making the vast majority of their revenue from GPUs? 80% or something so like that. So it becomes, it becomes more difficult there. Of course, then that brings up the question of what about the other partners who are majority GPU vendors as well, brands like Zotac and those sort of companies. They're the ones I'd be thinking more of, for sure, the exclusive yeah. partners. But obviously, you know, there's all sorts of different management styles with those companies that some people are going to be more willing to stick it out. I'd, if a company's making the majority of their revenue from one product, I think it's you're almost deciding to like close down the company mm -hmm. right at that point. I mm -hmm. think, you know, you'd have to have a CEO that was almost wanting to exit at that point. Like they, they didn't want to continue their company mm -hmm. anymore, mm -hmm. um, which for a brand like Zotac, who knows what they're thinking. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's likely to have too many impacts as to whether NVIDIA will treat their IABs better. Again, probably not. <laughs> No evidence of that so far. No. Um, I, I mean, I can't talk about things because they're under NDA, but you'll see how for upcoming GPUs, how the process is there with uh, how things are rolled out. And um, AIBs are certainly playing second fiddle there, but I can't really say anything else. Yeah, I mean, but that's been the case with previous launches as well. That Yeah, that's... So... Yeah, it's <laughs> no, nothing new or shocking. I'm just saying nothing's changed there. Uh, whereas you no, don't see that with AMD. It's possible that that would have been too soon as well to have any lasting impact sure. as well. That sure. said, you know, there, there was talk that EVJ had made a decision like this several months ago. So it's yeah. probably had to blindside uh, I video. mean, <laughs> changing how a review embargo is played out yeah, it does, doesn't make any difference, I guess. It could be done like that. Um, they could make they could still make the change now. I think that's the least of their issues, though. Yes. I think NVIDIA... I th the, the way I see NVIDIA operating as a company is they want to... And this is not like a hot take or anything. They want to control the supply chain without con having actual control of the supply chain. Yeah. Like, they want to produce Founders Edition cards because they can make more margins on it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, they're not having to give up slice of the pie to an AIB, mm -hmm. but they're trying to do that without having the manufacturing con control. Mm -hmm. Like NVIDIA is not, doesn't have a factory where they're an NVIDIA owned factory where everything is getting made with, you know, their, you know, founders edition cards. That's going to, that's an outsourced product. Yeah. If, if to we were to, to, if some we were to assume a few things, it's almost like they underappreciate their partners. They yeah. don't, they don't appreciate the, First of all, the, the finished product they produce. Yep. They don't appreciate uh, their manufacturing capacity, their distribution channels, yep. um, their, their brand and their ability to sell products around the world. Maybe that's being undervalued. And they're like, you know, why are they getting X amount of money for you know putting our thing on their product? We're, we're essentially making the product for them or making it possible for them to make the product. But I think that's kind of short. So I know I'm not saying that, that that's, what's been alleged, uh, but 
I'm not necessarily saying that's a situation, but if it is, it is short-sighted and a bit narrow um, of a, a, a field of view on that one because yeah. trying to replace all their... Like, the, the goal may be to replace all of their partners eventually to, to slowly get rid of them. I don't know. I, again, I'm not saying that is... But that's a big undertaking there. <laughs> that's not going to be easy to do. Yeah, uh, I, I think you know people have drawn the comparison between sort of like Nvidia and Apple mm-hmm. in the way like Apple does control everything about their products. Mm-hmm. So the iPhone, you know, parts of that are outsourced to other manufacturers, but they have very very strict controls over what goes down. They have very good supply chain management, and most Apple launches, despite the scale of what they're trying to do, go off without a hitch because they're. You know, they have control over all those things. Whereas I think NVIDIA, it seems like they potentially aspire to that, mm-hmm. where sort of you buy an NVIDIA GPU and it's an NVIDIA product. So it's made by NVIDIA, it's NVIDIA branded, no AIBs are involved, you're buying that. And it goes their, to the retailers, which is certainly achievable. It's it, it's achievable, but they're nowhere close to achieving it now. Well, because they've had a completely different system in place where Apple yeah. didn't necessarily have that. So yeah, and Apple's th- obviously built that up over many, many years. Yeah, yeah. So as you know, they've been able to scale that business the side of things quite mm-hmm. well. Whereas Nvidia, they can't just flick the switch on mm-hmm. that. And I think until they want to do that, or until they have the stuff in place to do that, they still need to treat AIBs with you know the respect that they kind of deserve because they are still producing the vast majority of the products that are mm-hmm. sold to customers. Mm-hmm. Like Founders Edition cards are a tiny little slice of what ends up being sold. So, yeah, again, I don't expect too much of that to change, but, you know, and and again, I guess NVIDIA can weather a company like EVGA quitting their business because they've got MSI and Gigabyte and ASUS and Mm. Zotac and PNY and all those other companies to take up the slack. Say say they wanted to achieve an Apple-type situation and maybe there became multiple founders edition models, like, you know, a liquid-cooled one and a, a big... Yeah, very. They sort of tried to do what the AIBs are doing. They had, it's still, especially if you come up against, you know, say the Radeon brand does become really competitive, and you have an actual real serious competitor. I get where you're coming from for yeah. sure, because yeah. I think one of the benefits that maybe Nvidia doesn't realize they have too much of, I'm sure they do somewhere, but you know, when Nvidia releases the 4090, right? Like, they've got all these other companies who are working to try and sell their products. So when you've got companies like, especially MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS. Big companies. Big companies. They don't just sell GPUs. They sell all those other things. Mm. So they, they can... It's a brand They can leverage well. that sort of thing, right? Like when MSI is selling a motherboard, potentially they could be like, well, oh, you're interested in an MSI motherboard. Have you thought about buying a, a well, RTX 4090? Gamers generally like doing that yeah. anyway. So, so. The, NVIDIA sort of gets this benefit where... The AIBs sort of cross advertise their products, mm-hmm. and and sometimes it gets to the point where you can get like almost entirely ASUS build builds, entirely Gigabyte builds, entirely MSI builds. That's how many products they make these days. Mm. And so, when you've got that those companies, it's almost like they're promoting for Nvidia mm-hmm. when they're when you go to MSI's website and you're looking for a motherboard. But oh, there's also the RTX 40 series cards that you may be interested in. Mm-hmm. And if everything was controlled in-house by NVIDIA, they'd lose that advantage of people going to sites to try and you know, do their full system builds or upgrade other components. Now suddenly it's gone from that advertising is kind of almost done for them to NVIDIA has to now pay board partners to you know, bundle their cards in or advertise it in some and other way. And they may not want to because they, may they, not want they can to. get a better deal with an actual partner. Um, yeah, and maybe, you know... MSI Gigabyte Asus is still working with AMD, so they, they can do all that stuff on the AMD side. But now for NVIDIA, they kind of have to... Yeah, which is where I was going with it. That's, yeah. that's sort of my thinking. Because so, people could say, you know, oh, NVIDIA is so big, so popular, they've got the mindshare, they can do that. But I'm sort of thinking of a world where they actually have a genuine competitor that has yeah. so much more variety. And that's what the PC platform's about, right? It is I about guess variety, that's, for sure. It's a, it's a So to lose that, uh, people don't want to... They don't want an Apple type approach on the PC platform. I'm not saying you, the Apple type strategy for a GPU couldn't work because it is still just one component, mm-hmm. right? Like there's still going to be, there would still be flexibility to choose other you just components. Need, you, need, you need all gamers to agree upon a design. They all like it. Yeah. like because when, is, when get... does a graphics card ever come out? Like, and, and I've thought some of the Founders Edition cards have looked spectacular. Yeah. But 
forget AMD fans, Nvidia fans, like it. It's so subjective, and people care about what their graphics card looks yeah, like. Yeah, like RGB, white edition cards. Nvidia's probably not going to make something like that. Just the actual design, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, the design. I mean, so. that's not so, that's not a reason I personally buy no. a GPU, but other people clearly it's, do. Yeah, it's clearly but, a big issue. Yeah, I, I just think that they're sort of, if they went down that path, there's a few angles that maybe they haven't considered fully, which mm. is... I think they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. But again, we don't even... Yeah. We're not... It sounds like we're saying they're definitely doing that. We're just exploring if that... Yeah, it's, 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 it's been suggested that's what they're doing. It's kind of like, you know, imagine if NVIDIA decide to start partner, partnering with game manufacturers. Because ga games, you know, the game partnerships is sort of another... They're not an AIB, obviously, but they're a, you know, they're a software partner of NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. So when you see... You fire up games and you see NVIDIA features, the NVIDIA RTX logo, you're seeing, you know, potentially their exclusive features in the game... That's generally a partnership that works like AIBs as well. Mm -hmm. And if Nvidia dis suddenly decide to not do that anymore, then and control everything in house, then suddenly they're going to have to start, you know, either paying for more advertising. You, you know, they're going to lose those benefits of the integration with their partners. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, some people think that game integrations are paid integrations. We've heard that they're mostly not, or almost entirely not paid integrations. So, you know, if they if they lost that thing, that again, they're losing that sort of free marketing mm -hmm. that they that they're going to get. So, the partners are important, I think, to yep. to Nvidia and and AMD and all these sorts of companies. It's it's all a, a sort of a mesh of things together. Yeah. If they went if they went alone, they'd have to spend more money, basically. Yes. So moving forward, it'll be interesting to see how much of a loss EVJ is to them. Yeah, they're a big brand, mm. big brand. So mm -hmm. we'll see. All right, Tim, I've got a CPU, GPU question. So naturally, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. You're familiar with these products, so Tim will have an interesting answer for us. Is the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D shaping up to be like the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti for AM4 owners? Um, I think I can certainly see the comparisons okay, there. Okay, cool. I mean, people who had a 1080 Ti didn't have reason to upgrade mm -hmm. for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think the 1080 Ti comparison, I can kind of understand why people kept that for so long because <laughs> the immediate generation after it offered virtually nothing mm -hmm. for unless owners. you wanted to spend significantly more money for yeah. You know. So it's kind of like you know we saw Turing didn't really offer anything for those owners, mm -hmm. and then the next generation was many years down the track. What was it like? Ampere to 1080 Ti was like four years, which is quite mm -hmm. some time. Mm -hmm. And I think with the 5800X3D, it's probably going to be, you know, because of the end of the platform sort of thing, you have to switch to a new platform. There's going to be lots of reasons not to upgrade. But I highly doubt that the very next generation in terms of the V-cache parts from Zen 4 are going to be offered no performance improvement. Yeah, well, it's the next generation as well, like Zen 5. Yeah, so I Zen 5. a huge leap forward prob again. Probably so. more performance. So I think I, I sort of agree with the premise of the question and I sort of disagree. It's, it's kind of it's kind of hard there, but I certainly think if you're on a 5800X 3D, there's, there's going to be very little reason to upgrade unless you want the bleeding edge performance. Yeah. Like it, if you want, if you must have the fastest part, it's not going to be the fastest part next generation. But it's going to suffice for, for most people mm -hmm. for quite some time. Yeah, that, that comparison probably applies to the 5800X 3D more so than any other CPU released in the last few yeah, years. Yeah, for sure. So, all right, Tim, did you bring the crystal ball? Uh, no. Well, just full disclaimer, guys, we'll be winging this one then. I know, it's going to be hard. Uh, if the A770, 8 gigabyte, I got it used to saying that as well, A770, because... Yep. Reviews perhaps coming soon. If that starts at three hundred and thirty dollars US, and the sixty six fifty XT regularly falls into the same price range, which one would your crystal ball guess to recommend us gamers to buy? <laughs> I think it's pretty easy to answer that one, right? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Again, it's hard to say without seeing the performance of it, but I would not buy an Intel product if it offered the same price to performance ratio. It has to be. But we say the same thing about yeah. AMD versus NVIDIA. Yeah, so it has but, to be better price to performance yeah. ratio. And I think, it's, again, if I was going to predict the performance, I'd say that's probably unlikely. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think the price that they've already gone with of $330 is quite low. Like, there were rumors ages ago that it was supposed to be more like 370 competitor, 370 Ti competitor, that sort of range. And those were supposed to be $500 GPUs, but the market has changed 
substantially since then. Mm -hmm. And even AMD's compared the 6700 XT is now what like below four hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. that and that's AMD's competitor to the target that Intel originally had for their part. Yep. And that's already fallen that far. So I think three hundred and thirty dollars. Yeah, it's see, it's 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 a bit weird because it seems like a low price, but then is it low enough? Yeah, and we don't necessarily need a crystal ball because, well, to 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 answer the two different scenarios. So if it's similar in terms of price to performance to a Radeon GPU um, or a GeForce GPU for that matter, but we're using Radeon GPUs because of the question. I can't see why you would buy a new entrant into the GPU market that is known not to have the driver support that it needs to have to compete on an even playing field with AMD and NVIDIA. A lot of the features still have bugs. I mean, we haven't revisited for a few months now. There's obviously some driver concerns there, ongoing support stuff. And there are some caveats in the sense that, you know, resize or bar is required. So your system needs to support resize or bar and have it enabled. Uh, so AM5 does that by default now, but uh, no other platform does. So resize or bars, a big one and older games as well. So, you know, DirectX 11 titles, 10, 9, all that sort of stuff doesn't play well um, for, for various reasons. So, yeah, it needs to be a good bit cheaper for you to take the gamble. Yeah, I 100% I agree. So it's going to be interesting to see where that falls. Mm -hmm. And I think the predictions that we sort of made since the very start of the sort of arc <laughs> launch period, which mm -hmm. feels like this launch period has been dragging on a year. indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it has to offer substantially better price to performance ratio. Mm -hmm. And that's relative to AMD, who then, as you said earlier, they need to provide better price to performance ratio than NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like there's there's two layers that Intel needs to beat versus NVIDIA and one layer versus AMD. So it's it, it's challenging. Of course, there's a price where it, it will make sense. Like there's, It's not like n never buy this product. It's just straight up terrible. Mm -hmm. That's unlikely to be the case. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you're sort of looking these days at it definitely being an entry-level part. Um, you know, I think the the hopes and dreams of it being sort of that even mid-range competitor launching so close to next-gen parts is just not going to happen. So. Yeah. Well, obviously, if it had have arrived a year ago for that price, we'd be singing its praises and it'd all be exciting. Yeah, they and probably you, could have priced it like $400, $500. Yeah, you, you, you could deal with needing resizable buy. You could deal with driver bugs and issues because uh, at least you had something that hopefully could game. Yep. Anyway, we'll we'll have uh, some very detailed information on that product and another one in uh, the not too distant future. Recently, the new GPU Power Connector made the rounds on Tech Media for having a rather low rated use count. By that meaning, how many times you can plug into a connector before it breaks. It was explained that this is normal for PCI power connectors. As a serial power connector abuser, how is Steve's experience with breaking six and eight pin connectors? Is it something we should actually worry about? See, I think this story, don't, don't quite remember where it originated from, but it's surrounding the new 12-pin power connector uh, on the new PCI 5.0 power supplies, ATX 3.0, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And, yeah, obviously talks about it breaking after something like 30 cycles of connections or something was the, yeah. the talk of there. So, yeah, it's, it's an well, interesting one. Well, yeah, so basically uh, the rating for this upcoming connector, we believe, is the same as current six pin and eight pin connectors so there's yep. nothing alarming or unusual there i think yeah this story's been picked up on and misreported or it's been misunderstood what the what the ratings are and what the the test you know conditions were regarding that but basically so for, from from my perspective six and eight pins as as the question asked i've never broken one ever uh i surely there's a six pin or eight pin in one of my test systems that has seen a thousand cycles now and um, yeah, I'm not too uh, too delicate with them. Um, mm -hmm. yep. I, yeah, you become yeah, sort of uh, you get over it. You get over it a bit when you're um, you know, plugging them in, unplugging them for game testing or whatever, doing 50 GPUs in one go. So you kind of just cram them in there and get it done as quickly as possibly, uh, as quickly as possibly, or as quickly as possible, something like <laughs> that. One of those words. Yeah, I do it a lot. Never broken one. Never broken a connector on a graphics card. Never broken the connector that goes into the graphics card. Definitely wore out a few PCIe slots, but never power connectors. Yeah, so this this sort of, I don't know, discussion mm -hmm. was uh, on the power connector and how many it's rated for, I think was pretty misleading. 
in terms of like, I guess the suggestion when you talk about, oh, it's only rated for 30 cycles is that as a general user, you will plug it in 30 times and then after that it will fail, which is not not how it works. It's, no. just, it's just straight up not how it works. I mean, the... The rating on these connectors and the rating, the ratings that you see for, you know, it's not just connectors. Lots of different things have ratings, not just this connector, other connectors and so on. It's not the average amount of connect cycles it will take to fail the connector. Mm -hmm. Whereas often on something like, you know, SSDs and so on that have endurance ratings, that can more often be, you know, either a rating or sometimes it's, you know, this may fail on average after this amount of time. You know, the mean time to failure is often talked about for things like hard drives. You know, those are a completely different methodology of reporting that number. A rating is we will absolutely 100% guarantee that no matter what you do to this connector, based on reason. all the information that we've given you in the spec table, so in terms of insertion force and you know bend radius and so on we are certifying that if you follow it all of those things it absolutely will not fail before 30 cycles and they're not saying like put it in like a fair no no like, they don't grab mean the that thing at all by the scruff and just they mean <laughs> what they mean is like so you can put the absolute maximum power rating through that connector which might be 600 watts or whatever the case may be it's super testing. high amperage mm -hmm. Um, so you you run it at that, which is going to expand all of the connectors inside. It's going to generally make them more fragile and so on. You can do that. Then you can insert it with heaps of force. Then you can bend it to the tiniest of bend radiuses that are possible with the cables that we've certified. And you can do all of that. You can you know put it in some odd operating conditions, do all that, and we're still saying that it's not going to fail. That doesn't mean you're going to do it normally 30 times and it's going to fail. That It means that we are absolutely sure that we have never seen a report from any of our customers that have used this connector that it will fail under those conditions. And that's pretty much what has been reported by people like Johnny Goo, who works at Corsair, mm -hmm. test, you know, very you know, important power supply guy that knows mm -hmm. a lot about power supplies. He was saying in a recent video uh, like Andy, about it. Uh, he spoke with Andy at eTechnics. So go check out eTechnics uh, if, you, if you want that. But Andy interviewed uh, Johnny Goo. They, had a, yeah, they talked about this specific topic. Uh, in quite a good amount of depth. Um, and yeah, he explained it all really well. Yeah, but so very good discussion there mm -hmm. about how, you know, during their power supply testing, you know, they test all the cables and stuff in these really vigorous manners where they're it's you know, running them. on a really tight radius. Twisting and them, turning them, f forcing them in, running super high amperages through them to try and melt them. They do all that testing and, you know, they're saying that it's, that sort of rating is normal and that you'll see the expected normal lifespan, which, as you said, you've never broken one. Yep. That's kind of expected. And, I mean, my understanding from the testing was that I think there's been two different ratings or metrics that has been conflated. So I believe someone saw that a Zotac, uh, I think it was a 12 pin from three eight pins or something yep. like that or four. It was, it was a four into 12, something like that adapter. And Zotac had given it a 30 rating. Yeah. Um, and then that somehow from that adapter, the, they made the jump to the actual full-blown cables. So a bit of a weird thing there. But again, even that 30 rating on the adapter, Zotac are merely saying like, well, it's a flimsy adapter for a start. It's yeah. not how the actual final cable will be. You've got, you've wedged a whole heap more wires, which makes it much more complicated, much more load on the pins when you have four wires feeding in instead of like one. And they're, they're basically saying, well, if people bend these tight and all that through our testing, it'll do 30. We're guaranteeing 30 beyond that. You know, yeah, and, exactly. and, and 30 is, you know, it's, it, that, that's a, a, a high estimate for what most people will do. Most people plug it in. Have, like realistically a gamer, they build the computer, they plug the power cord in the graphics card. Let's say they don't have to do any troubleshooting or whatever. What are they going to do? Like one yeah. for the life of it, two, three, half a dozen max. And even troubleshooting, that's probably where you get to half a dozen. Um, and and it may not even mean that it's failed, as in it breaks into a shattering of pieces. It well, that's mean... what I was about to say. The one that failed and burnt up, that wasn't from doing this and then like plugging it in, turning the system on, shutting it down, unplugging it. But that wasn't what it failed from. They'd bent it on a tight radius, a very, very tight radius, tighter than what you would do comfortably. And what that does is, so you've got your you, you got your pins. We've got one pin. This is actually, no, I'm not going to do that because that'll look. 
They'll look dodgy, won't it? Yeah, they, they'll definitely roast me for that. Well, you've got a pin, visualize it, and then you have a... Well, it's like there's two contacts yeah, inside the... But and, around, and then when you, you bend, bend it, it, it can bend off like that. So while it's meant to be like that, when you bend it, it can do that. And while it's still making contact, you're now setting the same amount of amperage through a much smaller contact patch that can create arcing. And eventually that's what leads to burning out a connector. You want, and this is why um, modular power supplies, there was a bit of a debate initially because having a fixed soldered or soldered um, connector, <laughs> you, you, you don't have that problem. But then when you have multiple different points of these modular connections, you run into having the chance of not having 100% contact. Which is, and so yeah. basically it burnt up because they were putting something like 55 amps around 600 watts in total through this connector that probably wasn't making full contact. The contact patch had probably been reduced by 80% or something and you know, it creates arcing and eventually it burns out. The, the yeah. uh, in, in, insulation on the uh, wire gets hot because that melts, catches fire, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think the, the whole thing comes from just the, the misunderstanding of what spe ratings on spec sheets actually mean mm -hmm. in that yeah again it's not it's not the average it's not this will definitely fail after this point it's mm -hmm. it's almost like it's almost like a legal certification for a user in that you know let's say you're running a big server deployment and you need these connectors to work for a certain number of times and you need to know exactly the conditions that it's designed to run at so that if it fails within normal operating conditions, you can then look at the, the sheet of things that it's rated for. And if you've done something that's out of the spec, then it's your fault because you've done it more than what it was rated for or you've mm -hmm. used it outside the ratings. But if it failed within the ratings, then the company that's produced the product could be liable and have all sorts of issues, warranty, etc., come mm -hmm. up to play. So basically when these connectors are rated for 30 insertions or whatever, it's saying do whatever you want because under the conditions we've set in our spec sheet, we know it's going to work. But beyond that, don't come to us and complain if it, if it breaks, which is very different to yeah the user conditions. And mm -hmm. and those ratings are very important. And it comes there's there's more ratings than just that for most connectors. It could be things like wattage. Like you can't put a thousand watts through a connector that's rated for six hundred watts and then have it blow up and be like, hey, that was the fault of the connector. It's like no, you've run it outside that spec. Mm -hmm. So this is the case. Of, Essentially, the, all the operating parameters yeah. are usually given temperature, you know, all these things, and they're all important. They're just not usually talked about because for general consumers, they are built for general consumer usage. So it's like, yeah, using your power supply in minus 100 degrees Celsius is probably not going to make it work. You've just never run into that operating condition before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, basically, yeah. To, to shut the book on this one, um, the rating isn't abnormally low. It doesn't necessarily differ from other power connectors that we've seen previously, Molox cable connectors, all yep. that sort of stuff. So there's nothing unusual or suspect or eyebrow raising about the rating. And it's been stress tested in similar ways to previous cables. So this is really a misunderstanding. A non-issue. A non-issue. Yeah. Wanting to upgrade to Zen 4, do I overspec the motherboard for what I need to run the chip I want? I mean, if the situation is the same as Zen to Zen 3, putting in X, uh, so 5950X in a B350 motherboard is possible, but not recommended. So to get the most value from a motherboard purchase with Zen 4, should I spe spec high to be ready for say Zen 5 to Zen 7, or well, who knows if Zen 7 is gonna be supported, but anyway, Zen 6 or, should be. or whatever the last AM5 architecture will be. So yeah, should you overspec your motherboard? Well, don't know is the answer for that one because the reasons I don't know is because we haven't tested uh, well we've tested no B650 boards yet we do have them and realistically I haven't really tested X670 boards either slash X670E so I plan on getting about 20 X670 boards which is about all of them and doing a big motherboard VRM thermal roundup in one video so with all of the boards so you'll get yep. your answer there it may be a situation where the absolute cheapest, and I think it possibly will be a situation where the absolute cheapest X670 boards work just fine um, with like a, a 7950X. May not be the case, but that's sort of what I'm expecting. So it probably doesn't matter which one of those premium X670 boards you buy. Probably gonna be a bit different with B650. Uh, yeah, I said that right, 650. There's too many B series chipsets. Yeah. I have to think, stop and think every time I say it. Um, but yeah, with AM4, it was a different situation for a multitude of reasons. But if you went back in time now, I think a lot of you would buy a more premium 
uh, B350 or maybe X370 board. The problem being though, um, B350 and X370 boards were generally pretty crap. There were some decent models, uh, which we've tested and looked back at, but a lot of them were pretty crap because, well, AMD yep. was coming off the back of FX, so that made sense, whereas AM5, totally different situation now. It's become not necessarily the dominant platform, but it's you know very well respected. Motherboard manufacturers don't want to have a crap board on that platform because it would be a bad look. But yes, if... If first generation 300 series boards such as the B350 and X370 were good, uh, you would you would certainly invest more money because being stuck with PCI Express 3.0, non-issue for gamers and most users, and really those boards had pretty much everything you needed. If you wanted to add 10 uh, gigabit LAN or something like that, you would just put a card in there. Um, I think back then it wasn't it wasn't like the B series had. PCI 3.0 and the X series had PCI 4.0. It wasn't even possible to buy the 4.0 right. board back then. Yep. And it's very similar to this generation that both the B and X series support PCI 5.0. Of course, there's differences in how many slots support that spec. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously the very high end X670E boards have the best PCI 5.0 support M2 across the most slots for track. everything. Yep. Um, and three, four years down the track, I'm pretty sure yeah, PCI Express 5.0 is going to be yeah. perfectly adequate for, for all users. And the difference is they don't seem that great to me. So I'll be, I'll be very interested to see your reviews on those boards to see, you know, is it worth getting the X-Series boards? Are they providing like really good VRMs versus mm. crappy VRMs on B-Series, which I don't really expect to happen? So it'll be, yeah. Some entry-level boards probably won't be that great. But, but again, if you get a good, like the, the issue with X670s is it's very expensive. Like you're spending, what, what was it, minimum yeah, look, 300 if, something if dollars? Yeah, look, the $125 boards that AMD's promised, you know, don't have VRM heat sinks or something like that, and they're pretty garbage. But if you spend $20, $30 more, you know, you get a board that can run all of the CPUs comfortably, then absolutely that's what you would do. But that would be my recommendation anyway. Whether you go the next tier up, it's Probably worth it if there's features there that you want as well. Not only are you getting a better quality, yep. quality VRM, but there may be other better Wi-Fi, better audio. Don't know, but yep. that's that's. I think the X series to me looks like it's for prof like it's almost like it's as we've seen over time with Threadripper being minimised mm -hmm. over time and sort of those like the seventy nine fifty X taking its place. It really seems like those X series boards are kind of like the HDDT boards of old, where mm -hmm. they're kind of trying to service the people that need the most connectivity. So even for gamers, there's probably going to be some B-series boards that are going to last a very long time oh, yeah. and are going to have really good quality, like they're going yeah. to have all the ports that you need yeah, and everything. it's basically so. guaranteed to be the case. Yeah. Anyway, we'll have a lot of information for you in the not-too-distant future. All right, Tim, I'm just going to read this one out really quickly because I'll be answer this one quickly. Would you consider redoing the benchmarks once RTX 40 is out to better have an idea of CPU scaling in games or is it just not worth it? It's definitely worth it, and I'll definitely be doing it, and I'm very excited to get the uh, 4090 and start comparing you know, the CPUs we've already looked at, and then, of, of course, Raptor Lake. Um, and again, I'd recommend holding off on any purchases until you've seen that data, and we have, we have all there is to know about the Raptor Lake CPUs. But yeah, I'm not considering those benchmarks. I'm committed to those benchmarks and can't wait. So yeah, expect to see them when it's possible to do so. So it'll probably take about a week to do a big benchmark comparison. So it'll be hopefully about a week or so after you see the first 4090 reviews. All right, Steve, do you think GPUs with AIOs will become mainstream again at the high end? I assume that's because we've got 450 watt GPUs. Yeah. More um, of them now. Yeah, so <laughs> mainstream at the high end. So yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I do. I think I think uh, there'll be a lot more of the sort of all-in-one liquid-cooled 4090s than what you would usually see. I I'm not sure they would become quite mainstream. I don't think they'd be the dominant 4090 model type sold, but certainly more mainstream than what you would have seen with a 3090, let's say. Uh, yeah. I think most brands will have an AIO. Um, I think maybe MSI is been seen to have one gigabyte usually does like a water force range so yeah they're, they're going to be more prevalent than what we've seen because obviously the power is just so insane and yep. not everyone wants a graphics card that's this thick and there's a big marketing opportunity there you know these ARBs love their marketing opportunities mm -hmm. and usually with those high-end cards like the you know the gaming z trio whatever it's called mm -hmm. the gaming z trio sorry people in the u.s for offending you there um 
with those cards, you know, normally they just add RGB or whatever, and they're mm. like they try and sell you on that. But this generation, they can go. But the power consumption is super high, so AIO, you spend money on the AIO, and I think mm. we'll see a lot of that. Yeah. All right, and we'll hit pause on the questions again for this month. It's been a mm -hmm. while since we've done a part three, but as we said in part one, there are just so many great questions this month with all the announcements, the releases, the new stuff that's been happening in the past couple of months to, to get through. So there will be a part three on the channel um, that you should check out soon once we get around to answering those questions. Uh, part one's on the channel as well, if you're interested. So go back, check out that video. Uh, we've got our Patreon and Float Plan accounts if you want to sign up and become a community member and chat with us in Discord, provide questions for the Q&As on there as well. Uh, we get our monthly live stream, which by the time this video comes out, you probably will have just missed for September, but there'll be another one yeah, in a couple month. of weeks. So um, yeah, always fun getting on there and doing that. BTS videos, lots of good stuff happening there. So yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much it for this part of the Q&A series. Mm -hmm. um, subscribe so you don't miss part three. And until then, I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Dave. We'll see you in the next one.